Welcome to Uprising Vandana Shiva. It's a joy to be back. Well, um, it's been a number of years since we spoke with you. So much has happened here in California. One of the most exciting uh, developments um, since I last spoke to you is the ballot measure Proposition 37, which has garnered a lot of excitement here in the state. Um, but as somebody who is an international activist, how far behind are Americans and is the U.S. government on the issue of labeling genetically modified organisms in our foods? Um, I think Proposition 37 is an opportunity for both the U.S. citizens, and I put the citizens first, and the U.S. government to catch up with the rest of the world. Um, Europe has had mandatory labeling, labeling from the early part of around 2003. India has just announced mandatory labeling beginning 1st of January 2013. And this is out of a case we filed in 2006, saying every citizen has a right to know what they're eating and a right to choose. You know, but do they want to be vegetarians, non-vegetarians? Do they want to be chemical eaters? Or do they want to be organic eaters? Do they want to be GMO eaters or non-GMO eaters? These are fundamental choices. And if on chemicals we can accept labeling, if on trans fat we can accept labeling, on simple things like how much salt in sugar food is we can accept labeling, why should the government and the industry be scared of just putting there? This has GMOs if they are not worried about what GMOs do and they're not worried about how much facts they are suppressing in the process of pushing GMOs on unwilling consumers not getting the full information. You are uh, a scientist by background. Your training is in science. The people who are against Proposition 37, Monsanto, which is a, a longtime foe of yours, um, say that the people who support Proposition 37 are anti-science because there is no evidence that GMO harms uh, human beings. Does one actually need evidence of harm in order to have labeling? Well, I think the labeling question is totally separate from the scientific debate of safety. Uh, a label is just a fundamental democratic issue. It's about the freedom of citizens to know and choose. A certain amount of salt is not harmful for us, but we still put it on the label. Calcium is not harmful to us. We still put it on the label just for people to make their decisions on the basis of information. Um, there are, of course, huge scientific issues related to... Um, uh, the GMOs and tragically it is corporations like Monsanto who are pushing anti-science, non-science on the public. I have lived long enough with this issue to know what they've done across the world. I was on the first expert group set up by the United Nations to frame the biosafety protocol and I saw how in the United Nations they tried to mislead but there was always far more information about the risks. So we have a UN Cartagena protocol. The United Nations, which is countries across the world, wouldn't have a protocol on biosafety if safety had been proven. Now, unfortunately, the United States is not a signatory, and therefore it is constantly denying its citizens the rights that citizens elsewhere have. Uh, Earlier this year, Codex Alimentarius, which is the highest body on food safety, said every country has a right to label. This was after a 20-year tussle where the United States had block, tried to block the right to label as a global right because then they could have used labeling to sue countries, which they did with Europe. Um, now on the science question, what is the science of genetic engineering? It is really not a science, it's a technology of shooting a gene that doesn't belong to a plant through two means. One is a gene gun and one is an agrobacterium, a plant cancer. You don't know where it's landing, you don't have the science of prediction. You don't know what it is doing. You don't know if it is getting absorbed. That's why you add antibiotic resistance markers. You know the plant is not expressing it, so you add super virulent viruses to pumping up the expression. They're called promoters. So you have a bundle of toxic, risky genes. All of the real science tells us there is a phenomena called horizontal gene transfer in nature, where 
Vertical is when your genes are taken from your parents. It's offspring to offspring. Horizontal is when it moves across species. We know the bacteria in our food hybridize with the bacteria in our gut. We know the viruses in our food hybridize with the viruses in our gut. We know, in spite of them saying that the Bt toxin doesn't last, new studies in Canada are showing it's been found in the blood of pregnant women and in the fetuses they've given birth to. A new st study in Jap France, two-year feeding study, <coughs> has shown very high levels of mammalian ca of, of cancer in mammals. A similar study had similar results in Russia, in the Academy of Sciences. These are independent scientists who have absolutely no involvement in any business industry interest. They are what we call public scientists. UK government asked Arpad Putsai, one of the most eminent scientists, to do a study on GM foods way back, around 98. And he did it. He was actually a promoter of genetic engineering. Mm. But when he did the study, he found the results. The, the rats he had fed had in shrunken brains and large pancreas and a collapse of immunity. He went to his director and said, if this has happened with three months of feeding rats, what will happen to a lifetime of feeding human beings? We should inform the public. They did. Went all over BBC. Immediately, this is what we've been told, a call from Monsanto to Clinton to Tony Blair to get rid of the top scientist who had left Hungary for freedom. And he said, I had more freedom in communist Soviet Union in Hungary than the freedom in corporate ruled England. That freedom is what the US is losing and US citizens are losing as corporations take over our science, our decision making, our food systems and our seed. So Proposition 37 is not an insignificant proposition. It is in a way a reflection of the larger debate on this election. Will money run it or will the people's democratic votes run it? Will democracy in America be of the people, by the people, for the people or is it going to be reduced to of the corporations, by the corporations, for the corporations, in which case you have corporate rule and corporate me rule means corporate dictatorship and corporate dictatorship, as Mussolini said, is fascism. The convergence of political power with economic power. Very dangerous moment, but also a moment that pushes us to create new levels of an aspiration and action for freedom. What would the ripple effect be if Californians passed Proposition 37, this is the biggest state, uh, the most economically successful state in the union. It's also the ninth largest economy in the world. And as you said, the U.S. is so far behind so many countries. Could there be a ripple effect far beyond California and globally if labeling, simply labeling, were to become law? <laughs> I think there'd be a huge ripple effect, not in the way the fear mongers, the no to Proposition 37 are saying. They're saying there'll be a $400 cost per family. That's nonsense. Labeling has never, ever increased costs. You just have to look at what happened in Europe. You just have to look at what happened with other food labeling. So this is totally creating fear, especially among the less privileged, who are already having a difficult time meeting their food bills. The second they're saying, oh, there'll be too much of a burden of segregation, etc. This is already an obligation California has when it exports. Mm -hmm. Europe requires segregation. You can't mix up GM seeds with non-GM seeds. So you're anyway doing it for your export market. Why don't you then expand it to your citizens? Surely you, they should be treated at least as equal to citizens elsewhere. The real ripple effect of the vote in California, and I hope it goes through and I'm throwing all my weight behind it, uh, which is a vote uh, uh, for truth against lies. The biggest ripple effect will be that Washington has actually been held captive by the Monsantos of this country and their lobby groups. It would liberate Washington. And we need a liberation of Washington to liberate the rest of the world. I've had to deal with my country where Washington tells the Prime Minister's office, because now they've got an agreement called the U.S. Indian Knowledge Agreement in Agriculture. Monsanto sits on the board. And the Prime Minister's office tells the regional governments, sign an agreement with Monsanto, hand over your seeds, genetic resources, research, and let them patent everything India's done for 5,000 years of farming. We had to do a massive 
Bij Yatra, I call it a seed journey, a seed liberation journey to get that MOU of Rajasthan cancelled. Poor little Nepal, tiny country, bullied by Washington to say, if you don't accept GMOs and write an agreement with Monsanto, we won't give you aid. Again, my colleagues in Nepal had to do a massive mobilization to say no to GMOs and no to Monsanto. So today, the empire is a GMO empire because it's then a patent empire. You collect royalties. The British collected rents from land and became the power of the world, really, by stealing from the peasants, which created the hunger of India and the two million deaths during the Great Bengal Famine. Today, this super extraction through royalties on seeds linked to GMOs. GMOs have no other purpose except to bring royalties to Monsanto. That is why the Brazilian farmers have sued Monsanto for $2.2 billion. That is why two hundred, two, nearly a quarter million Indian farmers have committed suicide because of the royalties they're paying and the debt they're getting into. So the ripple effect is absolutely huge. And, you know, freedom, in my view, is indivisible. And that is why every step we take anywhere in the world, the Parliamentary Committee of India that has said there's no role for GMOs in agriculture after the suicides, our recent technical expert group appointed by the Supreme Court has said there should be a 10-year moratorium till we start to do more independent science to inform the public. Most of what's passed as science these days is Monsanto's public relations because they just kill every, literally, the work, research, and lab of every independent scientist. They're going after Sarah Linney. They went up uh, after Arbat Putsa. The only reason they've not gotten rid of me, I got rid of a job in 1982. I have no job they can take away from me. And uh, that is the reason I've carried on for 25 years. Uh, you talk about seed slavery. And I want to ask you about that because slavery is a heavy word. If companies, and, the, and you've just also discussed how only five companies in the whole world now um, actually control uh, seeds. If seeds can be owned, then l food can be owned, which in turn allows these corporations to control life. Is that what you mean by seed slavery? I mean exactly that. After all, what was slavery when human beings were owned, captured in Africa, brought to the cotton plantations in this country? They were owned as property to be bought and sold. When Monsanto writes the WTO agreement on intellectual property and Monsanto is on record saying we were the patient, the diagnostician and the physician all in one. We defined the problem and for them the problem was that farmers save seeds and they offered a solution it should now be a criminal offense to save seeds. It should be an intellectual property crime. And they created this new fictitious law of intellectual property and patents on seed as if they were the inventors and creators of life on earth. When I heard these corporations talk in 87, this language of intellectual property, I said they want a slavery of life on this planet. If I am telling a plant, I have created you and your next generation is my property and I will manipulate you to my will, I will put toxic genes so that I can sell more toxics. I will put terminated genes so that there is no future seed. It's a sterile seed. This is the ultimate slavery because the earlier slavery was for one species, some people of the human species. This new slavery is an empire of all life, overall life on earth. And it is also leading to human slavery. The 2.7 100,000 farmers who've committed suicide, the quarter million figure of India, they became seed slaves. That's why they ended their lives. They couldn't find a way out. Um, the farmer in Europe who is being chased by new seed laws that these companies are putting in place, being told you can't have your own seed. If you have your own seed, that's a crime. Diversity is a crime. Your own seed freedom is a crime. And this is why we are giving a call for seed freedom globally and have we created the Global Citizens Alliance for Seed Freedom, issued a whole new report, global, both on the positive steps citizens are taking everywhere to save seeds, liberate the seeds, fight these corporations, as well as the new laws and the new implementations they're trying to shape. If you take it all into account, what we are really needing is something like the abolition movement. It was a handful of people who thought it was wrong, that people should own other people. 
When I started 25 years ago, it was a handful of us who thought it was wrong that some companies should decide to declare life as their creation and their property and then extract super royalties and sh close our options. Why is so much GMO spreading? Because GMOs are connected to patents. Only when GMOs grow will they collect the royalties. That's why all of Latin America is round up ready soya. All of Brazil is round up ready soya. All of the farming areas of the Midwest of this country is GM corn and soya. 2% of the soya is eaten as food. The myth that this is feeding the world is a big lie. It is feeding the hunger pro for profits of five corporations. And, and their argument is often that they can create these genetically modified plants that are resistant to drought, resistant to all of the sort of uh, temperament of nature. But in reality, don't these GM seeds often require more intervention, more chemical intervention, which then Monsanto happily sells to the farmers? Well, so far in these 20 years of commercialization of GM crops, and today we are not talking about the future, we are talking about an experiment of 20 years. There are only two traits that have commercialized on a large scale. One is a family of crops called the Bt crops, in which a toxin is taken from a soil organisms put into the plant. The claim is it will control one pest called the bollworm. That pest has become resistant. New pests have been created. In India, 13 times more pesticide is being used in cotton compared to what was happening before. The second family is the Roundup resistant crops or the herbicide resistant crops. This was supposed to control weeds. Instead, US has 15 million hectares of land overtaken by super weeds that can't be controlled by Roundup. Now they are asking farmers to spray Agent Orange mm. that was sprayed on Vietnam. So it is not the case that it does the pathetic work of weed control and seed con and uh, pest control, ecological farming does that much better. The argument that climate resilience they can engineer with a single gene is again a false claim. It's an anti-scientific claim. All complex traits like resilience to the environmental stress, whether it be climate or it be a pest, are multi-genetic traits. Many genes come into play. Now these seeds have been evolved by farmers and nature over millennia. Navdanya in its 110 seed banks saves climate resilient crops because we know this is what farmers need today. Salt tolerant seeds that we can use after cyclones. Flood tolerant seeds after flooding and drought tolerant seeds. All that the companies are doing is stealing and engaging in biopiracy of what farmers have bred and adding one gene of a toxic trait. Mm -hmm. Now, a herbicide tolerant crops means they sell more herbicide. Mm -hmm. And as they have said very clearly in conversations I've had, that every failure for them is a success. Roundup Ready 1 fails, they bring Roundup Ready 2 with two genes of Roundup resistance. Bolgard 1 fails with one gene of a Bt toxin, they bring Bolgard 2 with two genes and they've carried on up to eight genes every time they stack up the royalty. So for them it's a game that won't get lost because every failure means more chemicals, every failure means more royalties, every failure means more control. That's why the only thing that can stop them is people's democratic movements and that's why Proposition 37 comes back into the center of this discussion. I want to talk uh, Vandana Shiva specifically about India and how you know this is a massive country it's also a primarily rural country and uh, a country of farmers and uh, corporations like Monsanto have really turned uh, what's happening in India and India's farming system into an experiment but then adding to that mix you have retailers like Walmart that have entered into India um, and have really taken, you know, are excited about the potential for the Indian market. How does a company like Walmart that doesn't actually produce anything but simply sells sort of a middleman, how does Walmart complicate things further, both for Indian consumers but also more importantly for poor Indians, for Indian farmers? Well, the interesting thing is that it's a th 2005 agreement signed between Pre Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and President Bush at the same moment when they signed a nuclear agreement that was the attempt to open up India as a market for Walmart, the agribusiness, as well as Monsanto. Monsanto had entered earlier, but this agreement basically handed over research to them, handed over our genetic resources to them. And we've been engaged since then 
in stopping the expansion of the Monsanto empire and we're very proud to say that beyond cotton they haven't been able to expand. They tried to take over our aubergine, our eggplant, our bangan. 2010 we had a moratorium. We have 4,500 varieties of bangan and they wanted to do a BT bangan. We stopped it. There's no other food crop. Walmart tried in 2005. Walton family was there right away after sign of signing of the agreement. Uh, we mobilized hugely. I did a lot of research to show what would happen. Uh, in 2007 they got wholesale access but not retail. Last year they tried to push their way in again. Uh, the entire parliament responded and said no way. Suddenly they announced this year and I think part of the reason was the government was falling into a lot of scandals and there was huge political instability and I think they had pressure from the United States to say get Walmart through before you get out of government. Um, the government lost its very important coalition partner uh, Trinamool Congress of Bengal, Mamta Banerjee walked right out on grounds of what it's going to do both to the tiny retailers of India as well as to agriculture. Now this is what happens. India in my view is the richest retail economy of the world. When I say rich, I mean both the fact that it ha uh, has um, employment for directly for 50 million and then indirectly many, many more dependents. Indian society is retail. You step out of your house, you've got a sabjiwala outside. Morning they come in their little tele and call out the onions, you want onions, you want potatoes, you want tomatoes. Uh, we have doorstep delivery and for citizens it's convenient for the people who are doing it it's a livelihood this tiny retail matches with tiny production a woman can grow a little bit of spinach on a tiny plot on the outskirts of Delhi get it on her head and bring it to the market and sell it directly so that small connecting to small is what has kept India going Walmart with its volumes comes in it converts entire areas into potato cultivation of a particular size and then it plays with the agriculture promises everyone we're going to buy by and large the experiences they buy 10% of what they tell people they will buy that means 90% is left waste and that 90% has no other buyer left because their entry destroys the distribution chains that allowed that small producer to sell. Big retail goes with big agribusiness. So before you know it, India's small farms will disappear. They won't be able to do this legally because our, our love for the land and our struggle for land reform has been so intense that changing land rights to say you can't have a two acre farm, there'll only be a hundred thousand acre farms, it won't work. We will have a revolt. But they're going to go through the contract way and they're already doing it. Government of India is giving subsidies to businesses to say, take over 10,000 farmers, take over 20,000 farmers, we're going to help you. That will be the supply chain. The public relations spin is provided from here. And the argument, oh, we'll get rid of middlemen, as if Walmart is not a middleman. My research shows that from the time in 91 when we got neoliberal policies, our the difference between a farmer's income and what a consumer pays has jumped from 6% to about 50%. If Walmart comes in, the data around the world is only 2% of what the consumer pays goes to the farmer. So we are, the genocide of Monsanto in the areas of cotton is going to be accelerated on a very, very large scale with a Walmart genocide. And that is why we are not accepting it. We are fighting it. And um, I have a case in the Supreme Court. And uh, I work with the entire network of hawkers and retailers, but more importantly, with the farmers. Um, I was just in Hyderabad for the big convention on biological diversity. We spend half the time in the UN, but half the time with the farmers, showing them the linkages of what a giant retailer like Walmart will do to farming. Because part of it is, it is so sudden. It is so big that no one can imagine. And people say, why are you afraid? I say, I'm not afraid. I know. But that poor farmer has no experience. If you ask people in Tamil Nadu or in people in Fukushima, 10 days before the disaster, are you afraid of a tsunami? They have said, no. 
Mm. What's a tsunami? What arm can it do? And then it knocks you out. Then you are afraid. I'm speaking with Vandana Shiva. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we will cover the successes that she has managed to uh, achieve in India and what we can learn from them. We'll be right back.